All right. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us on today's very special edition of MetalCon Live and the NCA present MetalCon Takes on Solar, a Metal Roofer's Guide, a Metal Roofer's Perspective on Solar Installations. Today's session will be presented by Dustin Haddock of S5, Bob Zabzik of ZTech Consulting and the NCA, Leanne Slattery of ATAS, and Mark Geis of S5. We also have as a special guest who's helping answer some questions on the back end. We have Andy Williams from the uh, NCA as well. Next week, we are going to two weeks, and we will be presenting another MetalCon Live presentation Seven Ways to Blast Past Supply Chain Talent Shortages, Price Pressure, and Other Metal Construction Profit Killers. This will be presented by Frank Stasiowski, Alex Carrick, and Tony Buquo. This is a return to one of our favorite presentations that we do on a quarterly basis with Frank Stasiowski as well. So be sure that you mark your calendars for that. The MCA is today's sponsor for today's MetalCon Live. If you have any questions about membership, including how to get a 10% discount exhibiting at MetalCon, you can reach out to Jeff Irwin. His contact information is on the slide here. Don't forget, MetalCon is coming up in just a few short months, everybody. You can get on the pre-register list right now. Also really exciting news, our registration will be going live in the very near future. So be sure you check out our website and check back pretty regularly for additional information. Don't forget, at the end of today's seminar, if you need to get your AIA credit or want to receive a certificate, please fill out the survey that comes at the end of this. That survey is not shared with anyone, and it's just a way for us to gather your AIA number and the email address you'd like us to send your certificate to. If you run into any technical issues, please feel free to message me, MetalCon Live, in the chat box or in the Q&A section. I can help you out there. For all questions today, please submit them as you have them. All questions will be answered closer to the end, but we want to see what questions you've got as they come through, the way we can help better answer and have a much more concise response towards the end of that seminar. You can submit those questions either in the chat or in the Q&A section. Without further ado, I'm going to hand this over to Leanne. Mark, Bob, Dustin, and Andy. Thanks, everybody. Here we go. Thank you, Kaylin. As um, most of you are aware, uh, the solar photovoltaics, or otherwise known as solar PV industry, has been rapidly growing, not only in the United States, but also globally. And it's continued to, it's going to continue to go that way. Um, not only the environmental benefits that are achieved by using solar, it's also a sound investment to provide um, carbon-free electricity and lower costs than traditional uh, fossil fuels. So um, although today we're not going to dive into so much the, the aspects of the PV itself, um, it, the PV as a rooftop solar system works alongside the, the roof that it's going to be installed over. So um, that's one way to um, achieve some of your uh, longevity and, and cost savings is to look at it as an entire system or an asset. So I, I like to think of uh, especially standing sea metal roofing as the perfect platform or a solar ready platform for these solar PV panels. So we're gonna jump right into this here and start off with the obvious first question would be, why is metal the perfect platform for, for solar, for a rooftop application? So let's start off with Dustin here um, to talk a little bit about the service life and availability or durability. Uh, before we do that though, a quick mention, much of what we're going to be talking about today has been um, covered in three white papers that are now available through the Metal Construction Association. All of these have to do with metal roofing and solar PV systems, and it's pro broken down into a three-part series. So we start out with the service life comparisons and then move on to mounting system methods and then found, finally the mounting system installation. So um, again, I'll, I'll remind you at the end of our presentation, but these are great resources to look into if you're considering getting into this, this end of the business with solar PV. So moving on now with Dustin. Uh, would you like to start off the discussion and just talk a little bit about the service life? Yeah, thanks, Leanne. Um, this is kind of the first and most obvious that you know has 
has kind of gripped the solar industry when looking at your mean service life of a metal roof as compared to other roofs. Um, here you're looking at a chart that's showing um, the, the different stages of life of various roof types with metal coming in at just plus um, 60 years coated steel where some of your more common roofs, TPO, asphalt shingles, um, in, in many cases, way less than half the actual mean service life of metal. Why this is important is because when you're looking at putting or retrofitting solar onto a roof, um, that's a 25 year plus warranted solar panel. There's even modules right now looking at going beyond that 25 years. Um, putting that 25 year power supply on a 10 or 15 year roof, what that ultimately means is the roof will expire before the life of the, of the solar assembly. So ultimately you're gonna be installing solar, then your roof dies, um, expires in terms of its service life. You pull the solar off, re-roof, and then put the solar back on. Um, with coated steel, that's not an issue. And so you're not installing the system two and three times, uh, you're installing it one time, which in terms of life cycle costs is extreme savings. And we'll kind of jive into that a little bit later. Great, thanks, Dustin. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the sustainability aspects uh, of metal roofing are um, a big reason why people would choose to go that route. So, Bob, can you talk to us a little bit about sustainability? Sure. Uh, it's actually, um, it's really good that that Dustin uh, made the point that he did about service life going into this discussion. Um, and we'll talk about that in a, in a second. Here's some first, though, some stats uh, regarding just general use of landfill space used for obsolete roofing materials that um, came from, well, you can see the NHB, National Association of Home Builders, and the uh, Public Works uh, Corps of Engineers did some studies. So just back up one here real quick. Just um, just to kind of give some basic uh, information on how much how much landfill space is used for roofing materials. It's pretty amazing. So that that service life essentially means you know you skip that for that impact for roofing, uh, metal roofing, and and it's important to remember that because when you start looking at sustainability, it's not just uh, your impacts, your environmental impacts that you have to address. They are actually spread out over what's called a use phase. So. The longer you that material functions and performs its basic function, uh, the, uh, the the better and more impact you get. So what we're seeing is a movement in the market and sustainability and 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 really mo moving towards a from a single attribute uh, type of approach, which is what recycled content would be. You know, I'm putting all my sustainability eggs in the basket of recycled content, so to speak. And we're, we're, we're moving from that to a really more global uh, holistic approach through LCA and EPD. So go ahead and hit up on the next slide, Mark, and we'll talk a little bit about what that means. Um, you know, we have done, like a lot of other industries, we as a metal roofing industry have done a lot of work with um, LCDA here lately in the last 10 years uh, producing EPDs. And, um, you know, a lot of folks are using those, downloading them. It's one of our more popular downloads, but a lot of folks are using those uh, for their projects, uh, their uh, lead projects or, or whatever program they're operating under. And what's, what you got to remember about, the, uh, about these things is that, you know, when you download an EPD and you get that data, it's broken down into different impact categories. There'll be global warming potential. Uh, ozone depletion potential, acidification potential, eutrophication potential, smog formation potential, and then what they call abiotic depletion, which is depletion of non-renewable resources that focuses mostly on fossil fuels and the construction. But these are really very data-driven approaches, and um, they're you know, dictated by ISO standards. And there is a uh, differing functional units. When you download the EPDs, you'll look at, like, for instance, our EPDs that uh, we have on our, our website, and it's also hosted on UL's website, focuses in on 100 square meters of, of uh, cladding material. That's uh, about 1,080 square feet if my metric uh, uh, conversion in my head is working correctly. And you have to resolve those functional units between different materials. Uh, and then those EPDs, even though there's their documents called 
uh, PCRs or product category rules that kind of drive the scope of the EPDs, those PCRs are not necessarily, they're very well coordinated within materials, but not necessarily well coordinated across materials. So you have to go and look at the scopes and address the differences in scopes. And of course you have to, I mentioned all the impact categories. A lot of people tend to focus on global warming potential, for instance, which is your carbon uh, uh, release, but putting all your attention on that, you know, takes away from uh, other things and you might be paying a greater penalty. So how do you weight those? You know, these are really things that are outside the scope. That last subject really kind of outside the scope of typical LCA. And they're really looking towards the individual programs or authorities having jurisdiction or whoever to make the decision about which of those are more important than others. So it's it's a right way to go. It's holistic. It's data driven, but it's just it's complex, and there are a lot of layers to it. So go ahead and hit the next slide. But like I mentioned, we have um, done a lot of this work, like uh, many of the other industries, and we have those industry average environmental product declarations available on the MCA and UL websites for three core materials that our membership uh, makes. Roll forms cladding, and that's both steel and aluminum, steel and aluminum roof and wall panels. Uh, insulated metal panels, if you're familiar with that, those are uh, uh, basically composite panels, two metal skins with a foam uh, insulation core. And uh, it's a multifunction assembly, so it also kind of has some unique things about it in the use phase you really need to consider. And of course, metal composite materials, which are uh, aluminum panels that have a, uh, a core material on the backside that's mostly for flatness. It's, it's not necessarily an insulator, but those are used over cavity walls and a lot of our members are, are make those materials. So those three EPDs are available for download. Uh, and, and if you have any question, of course, there's an ask an expert link on the MSA website. So feel free to click it, it'll come to me or Andy and we'll answer your question. Thanks, Bob. Um, I think a lot of building owners are, are really interested in exploring rooftop solar systems for their buildings. But like most things, a lot of it comes down to budget and cost. So uh, Mark, can you talk to us a little bit about the, the life cycle cost of uh, such a system? Sure, thanks Leanne. So, you know, I guess the first wave of solar in the seventies was really all about the environment, but the sort of the culture of the hippie, the California hippie being disconnected from the grid. It has really become the last couple decades now again it's of course it's um, you know on the rise again and now a lot of it is about um the the cost and how much you get out of it that value and it's become really a worthwhile investment um and with and we've been talking about the longevity of the, the service life of a roof and the value of that so when you couple a solar asset with a roof asset and look at it as one asset you can really see the advantages of a metal roof. And so if we look at the cost stack up, yes, a, a metal roof is more expensive than other types of roofs like shingle roofs or uh, single ply membrane roofs. Um, but once you put the solar in, solar is a little bit less expensive on, mo on metal roofs, especially standing seam metal roofs. There's just less material, uh, less labor involved. So when you're all comes, you know, when you have now your total system, um, you're really ahead of the game with, um, with metal you know lower cost with metal roofs and you know arguably you know things are you know everything's different every project is different so you're at least even but what the benefit now you have now a metal roof on your building so um and really where the cost comes in so here's that really the cost comparison of an all single asset now we talked about this what happens if um these other roofs that don't have that life cycle don't have the service life as long as the metal roof so you may end up um, having to pull out and replace the the other the roof in midst of the, the life of the solar system, so that cost if you put that cost into it it becomes a no brainer. It really shows that total cost um, is and, and this is in sort of roofers terms metal metal in construction terms square foot. People in the solar industry think of things as dollar per watt um, of what they install, but this shows that you know you're way ahead of the game if you look at the life cycle cost. And look at this as a, as, a, as a single system, a single asset. Um, and another way that people look at this is with what I would call- Mark, before you move on, could you dive in a little bit in terms of, you know, better describing why the total first cost as it relates to solar on metal, uh, just a little more detail as to why that's cheaper than when looking at other roof types? 
Yeah, Dustin, and you can ch chime in your perspective as well, but it's a, a, for, we'll get into that as far as different types, but generally on, on a metal roof, you'll see a flush system. So there's very little material. There's le less material generally, especially if you do not use rails because metal roofs really have rails. Um, and then um, specifically standing seam roofs, you don't, you're not penetrating the roof. So it's very easy to, to, to grab a hold of the roof at the seam and then just and then a, install the um, solar modules onto it. So that labor and less material with less rails, if you're not using rails, that all adds up to a lower installation cost um, all in. Do you have hey, anything else you want to you add? Yeah, I mean, I was just going to say if the, for the audience members that they, you know, hearing the terms the rail and, and the various, uh, th we actually have some slides later to show what that is. Right. So hang on with us. Right. And then, I mean, the other part of it in terms of, you know, installing jacks that need flashed and waterproofed and, and whatnot yeah. um, takes a tremendous amount of time and energy and, and labor. And so, yeah. Yeah. So for other types of roof, you're flashing, you're penetrating that roof, standing seam roof, you're not, you're not <coughs> penetrations. So to, to sort of put a, a point on the replacement cost, it's very common. I don't know if anybody's familiar with this. It's very common to look at the value of a solar solar system in terms of cash flow analysis. So this is really a cash flow analysis um, that the, the line on the on the left side, that's your initial cost. Your black horizontal line is your yearly savings, and that just adds up on with the orange line. And this this system, this is just an example, has about a six year payback. So the, the rest of it is. Um, you know, that's your net positive, positive cash you get over a 30 year period, the life of the system. Um, and it's common to measure these things with cash flow and what's called net present value or IRR, which is your internal rate of return. And this is about what you get. So you're investing 145,000 and your net present value of all that cash is 276,000. This is an example. And the IRR, your return is about 21%, which is a great return on your money for putting that in. But now, you know, if we talk about the potential with other roof types of having to, in the middle of the life, put a new roof on, um, this is what you're, this is how to visualize that. Like in the middle, like say year 20, you have that dotted line, which is your cost of replacement and, and with time without power and, and putting everything back on together. Um, so what that does is that, um, you know, really creates a wreaks havoc on your total cash flow as visualized there. So that, you know, that blank area is really your lost cash opportunity that you have um, from having to do that in the middle of a, of a, of a you know, the life of your, uh, of your solar system. So that's the value of putting it on an asset on a roof that lasts longer than the, the solar itself. So, that, you know, that's really all I have is on the, that ROI, but, you know, you can really see how valuable it is to put solar on metal roof. Thanks, Mark. And now we're going to move on and, and review some basics about metal roof and the solar panels. Uh, Bob, can you touch upon the different types of metal roofs that, over which uh, a PV system could be installed? Absolutely, Leanne. I, I, before I do, though, I'm going to make a follow-up comment to Mark's, uh, do you need to back up slides, Mark? Just follow-up comment to Mark on the cash flow analysis. You know, this is not magic. This is the same kind of analysis you do on any project construction, financial investments, it's all the same, same, same rules. And what's interest has always interested me about uh, the sustainability aspect of this too, is that's not really very different from what you're doing with sustainability, uh, your initial investment or your initial impacts that you get from an, uh, an EPD, but it's use phase that, that drives what your actual performance is and why it's very important to don't stop at EPDs. That's the short answer. Um, look into drive this all the way across to great cradle to gauge situation with the project specific LCA. It's very much that same concept. But um, yeah, going back to uh, the roofs uh, options, you know, Mark has mentioned both of these systems already or Dustin as well. Um, so, you know, they fall into kind of two general groups. There's on the bottom left there, what's the you know, exposed fastened metal roof or through fastened roof or panel roof. You'll hear it called a lot of times. Um, and this particular visual example is, 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 is installed over open framing or, or Z Perlins. 
And then on, uh, well, in the middle part, there is just a section of what, it, what one of those uh, side lap details looks like. There's a lap faster and tape seal in there, and that's significant for um, uh, diaphragm action and, of course, leak resistance. And we're going to come back to an important, a point, a point, important point about that in a second. But up in the right upper right-hand corner is a visual example of a standing seam metal. This particular example is over deck. Uh, over a you know, drawn wood deck. Now, I think the important thing to remember is, is that this is actually, you, there's cross-pollinization too. I can have a through fasten roof over a wood deck and I can have a standing seam roof over, over open framing as well. And all of the requirements, the performance requirements for these are of course driven by the International Building Code chapter 15. So if you were to look and open up your, 50, your uh, IBC, uh, look at for instance, section 1504.3, where it talks about the performance requirements for wind up left for these various systems. So the deck systems, be they standing seam or uh, through fasten roof, their, their performance requirements for wind up left are generally driven by UL 580 or 1897. Uh, and then uh, for standing seam roofs over open framing, you can do you, uh, the test that's cited is uh, ASTM E1592 is a vacuum chamber test. Uh, you can do vacuum chamber chests for through fasten roofs as well, but you don't necessarily need to. The AISI, underlying AISI code, uh, allows you to do calculation for this scenario over open framing, but it still needs to be tested to 580 or 1897 over deck. So all this is important because, you know, one of the main things the roof does is it resists, it resists uplift, but it doesn't just resist wind uplift. It's providing you leak resistance during that period of time. And and um, you know one of the the the, the aspects about uh, wind loads all came all too apparent uh, during the uh, Hurricane Andrew in Florida when we saw a lot of of uh, debris being picked up off of roofs, rocks from ballasted roof, or just uh, you know pieces of glass or, or two by fours or whatever that were driven into other buildings, and so you had a building that was probably doing okay or certain could have been doing just fine in terms of storm resistance and then it gets hit with this with this flying object and that's called windborne debris and so there's a lot of uh, a lot of aspects about this design that's important to keep your solar panels on that roof because in those types of events uh, you know you don't want that solar panel to become uh, a piece of windborne debris. And so you'll hear a lot about penetration free systems. Mark mentioned that. So the standing seam panel there has a seam, as it says, profiles vary, but you can get all kinds of different hardware and accessories to attach directly to that seam and essentially turn that seam into a rail. And by doing that, you, uh, you, you've not just eliminated the material, but she's also created a situation where the, flood, the, the panels, the solar modules, PV modules are closer to the plane of the roof. That's important from wind resistance standpoint. We'll talk about that here in a few minutes as well. But um, the key thing is, is that this whole system still has the function to resist wind. Um, particularly for rack mounted system, those wind loads can be quite a bit higher uh, or at least uh, uh, more concentrated is probably a better way to say it. And uh, you, so you've got to, you know, that comes into play with the design of the, of the um, uh, anchorage as well. So why is, you know, it's kind of, it, it's really one of those things that, that you wind up not spending a whole lot of your overall budget of a solar project on the mounting system, yet you could argue it's one of the more important parts of it because it, it ensures that that, that that PV system's durable, will last a long time, but most importantly, uh, won't come flying off the roof and, and cause other problems. Um, so you get the penetration free aspect of standing seam roofs, but it's also important to remember, while there are a lot of options to, to attach metal roofs onto exposed fastener roofs, and they all work well or, and, and, and when installed correctly and, and, and monitored importantly. But the key thing is that if you've already got fasteners penetrating your roof, like you do with a, with a, uh, a an R panel roof or, or through Vassen roof, then maybe, you know, dry, you, your impetus to get a penetration free system on the PV may not be so important as long as those uh, penetrations are correctly uh, treated. And that's how they're done in the side lap. And so there's, there's great advancements in the faster industry for ceiling washers and lawn life fasteners with headed uh, heads on them, domed heads that, do a great job at resisting leaks and uh, 
every metal roofing manu or excuse me, every metal roofing installer uh, uses them, knows how to use them, should, should be able to install them successfully with a screw gun, which is why it's really important you want a metal roofer doing those installations because the solar guys may not necessarily know those, know those inherent details. Those are some great points, Bob. Um, now that we've talked about the, the types of metal roofs, let's move on with Dustin. Um, can you touch upon the, uh, the structure that are underneath the roof panels and, and the connection of the roof to the actual structure? Yeah, I, I'm, I think Bob hit almost all those points pretty well. Um, the one thing that I would like to kind of point out is what he it talked about in the roof itself kind of becoming a rail. Um, in the sense of you've got a rail every 12 to, in many cases, 24 inches, depending on the roof, it gets wider with other roof profiles, but you've got a rail there every 12 to 24 inches. And when it comes to load and spreading the load uniformly into the roof, into the structure, that gives you a point of attachment directly to a module, um, which is gonna spread the load from the modules into the roof in a more uniform manner than what you would see with a typical rail installation where the rail is fixed, you know, every three feet or something like that, three to four feet, um, where they're point loading the roof itself in those areas. Um, but that's kind of, Bob covered this pretty thoroughly. I would like to dive into the, the next slides for sure on just solar on metal roofs so we can kind of see this coming into play. Yeah, I think a couple of folks have asked about it. So here, here's right. your eye candy. Here we go. <laughs> um, and I think, Mark, you're going to talk about yeah. this. What you're looking there to the left um, is a building. That's Apple World Headquarters. Um, every module there is fixed. That's what we call the direct attach method. And but this is an interesting one because you see the space gaps between and the modules mounted in portrait. Um, typically you'd see them in landscape on a standing seam. Um, but there you're seeing a flush mounted system. Both of those are flush mounted systems. Um, but I'll, I'll let you go from here, Mark. All right. So the, uh, these are just, this is just an overview of the two basic extremes. One, this is, as Dustin said, Apple headquarters, it's a 7.4 megawatt, huge system. And then on the right is just a typical residential um, installation, probably maybe five to 10 kilowatts, pretty small system. Um, so the, let me just go through the basic ways that you see these attached. So on metal roofs. So it's common to have probably the more common type is having a flush mount system, meaning they're no tilt, they're flat, and they're very close to each other because there's no shade involved. So they can actually be touching each other, like in this picture. And you can see in the circled area, that's, those are the rails. So the rails are clipped on to the, to the seams. And those are typically would be a standing seam clamp, which is a, a clamp with a, just a set screw that that um, interlocks then mechanically fits into the seam that prevents it from uplift, no penetration. That's like the key to these roofs is you don't have to penetrate. Um, here's another. Wait, this is Mark, if you could go back, I want to try to grab a question that just popped up that this slide kind of answers. On a typical rail system, what you're seeing here is the module being fixed to the rail, the rail then being fixed to the standing seam. You see that circled there in red. Uh, if you look further down to the right, you'll see where that module then is again fixed to the rail. Um, but that, that connection of the rail to the roof may or may not exist on that next seam. And so when you're talking about spreading the load more uniformly into the roof by doing a, a direct amount attachment system, you're taking the module directly to the roof as opposed to the module to the rail, then to um, the rail to the roof, which that rail is more than likely not going to be fixed as frequently as right. if you were to take the, um, the module itself directly to the roof. And so yeah. that spreads the load more uniformly into the roof than most typical rail applications. Yeah. If you look at that rail, one of those rails, they're probably, you know, at six feet before you hit the next attachment. So there is more connections from the modules to the rails than there is from the rails to the seams, as Dustin said. So if you got rid of the rails and mounted directly to the seams, you'd have more a higher distribution, lower point loads. So here's another view. This is a steep, steep slope. It could be residential, flush again, rail based. Those red lines are where the rails are. Typically, this would be portrait. It's the same concept. You're attaching 
um, the rails to the roof, and then you're attaching the modules to the rails. Um, as opposed, another type of, of flush mount is a direct attach. So the concept is, the argument is that you don't, the rails are there. Um, seeing the circle area, those seem just like the rails that showed in a rail-based system. So the rails are there. So why put a rail on top of a rail? That's the argument. And then, as Dustin said, th there is generally a higher distribution, more distribution of loads because there's more touching points to the roof. Um, and without having to, without the rails that have to be pre-measured and laid in exactly ahead of time, most of this stuff goes on the fly and the, the module itself is the jig as you build. So the concept is it's, it's just less work because, you know, less, less logistics um, because you're not, attacked, you're, there's no rails involved. Uh, and we could talk more about that. If, and so then the third basic type is a tilted system. And there are tilted systems on, on standings on metal roofs, as, as you can see. Um, the attachment to the roof is basically the same, similar attachment. Then there's, then there's a mounting system on top of that, and that's tilted. Now, with a tilted system, you have to have a space in between these rows, as you can see, because of shading. So the trend has been definitely going towards a flush system. Those are much more common these days. Um, and it's because solar panel costs have gone down. So it's better to have more panels. People tend to want to have more panels on the roof, even though they're giving out less energy in a given year. Just that's generally what people want now. So they'd rather go with a flush system or very low slope. So there's not that much of a gap and you can just put more, more solar panels on your roof. Yeah, kind of to discuss that a little more is with the, you know, in the 70s and 80s and even early 90s, the cost of solar panels um, was a lot different than it is today. Yeah. And, you know, making a model as efficient as possible was kind of priority because of how expensive the modules were. When you're looking at a tilt mounted system, and you know, it's a good idea to compare. So look at that system as a tilt mount system and the production that you would get. Also look at the space loss and the expenditures of the added hardware to tilt it up. Yeah. And then compare that to a flush mounted system by adding more modules using the space on the roof as much as possible before making decisions on tilted systems. Yeah, the cost of a tilted system is generally more than a flush mount because there's just more material, more work involved. So that goes into play too. But basically people are willing to give up a little bit of energy on an individual module to get more total energy by put, putting more together in a flush mount system. So all that right. ties in with what is required to put a system on a roof. Okay, and we're, we're going to move on. Um, you know, at this point, we're talking more about the technical factors of mounting the PV systems on metal roofs. And we have to keep in mind the PV system mounting, um, that's, that's only about 5% of the total system cost, but it's such a critical uh, factor when it comes to performance. So Bob, can you talk to us a little bit about that? Sure, I, I'm, I'm laughing because uh, and one of the messages just came across the screen about tilt systems and the wind loads involved uh, by a gentleman by the name of Keith and, and uh, I'm looking for the camera in my room because he <laughs> apparently has figured out what my next slides are. So congratulations, Keith. Um, let me know when you head to Vegas. All right, so what we're gonna look, we're gonna look at a couple of things. Um, the, but before I kind of get into that technical aspect of it, <clears throat> Let's just back up for a second and talk about roofs in general and what they do. I'm, my background is in structural engineering, so you know, um, and uh, I've have installed my fair share of metal roofs. Um, my, my family was in the business, but um, it it has been uh, kind of a this is a passion area of mine because I I firmly believe, like most engineers, if you're going to do something. You can do it right. And, and I think with solar in particular, it's a big investment. And uh, you're, as Mark has shown you, it's, it's not just something you do to feel good about the and not you can, you can feel good about the environment, but it, it actually is something that is financially a viable investment. It outperforms a lot of other investments. And so uh, it's, a, it's a deep passion area of mine. So what is a, the risks that you take undertake by putting a PV system on a roof um, are not uh, inherently different from the risks that are, are with uh, that you come along with any roof 
without a PV system, but the PV system accentuates certain things and you need to keep that in mind. So let's just talk for a second. What does the roof do, right? Well, A number one, it keeps water out of the building. I think that's the main thing that we're trying to accomplish. Uh, it does protect the building from wind and is exposed a lot to wind damage uh, because there are really a lot of unique things that happened that happen when a, a wind stream hits a building, particularly, uh, uh, I'm gonna say something kind of silly, but there's a reason why, particularly buildings close to the ground, because a lot of the wind research that you see, all buildings are close to the ground, right? But a lot of the wind research that you see is based off of aerodynamic wind tunnels on PV, PV systems that, that have been tested using the type of air, uh, uh, wind tunnels that are used for aircraft design and that kind of thing. So Factory Mutual, if you know who they are, they've done some research on this and published some guidance on it. And they should really, you know, you really need to focus on results that have been generated by a bit, what's called a boundary, uh, uh, ground boundary air, air, uh, air tunnel. And so ASCE got into this. Actually, they got into this after the uh, SEOC, the Structural Engineers Association in California, started doing some research on this and, and really looking at the, at the air tunnel, the wind tunnel tests use the ground boundary layer type of air tunnels. And, and they came up with what I'm getting ready to show you. Uh, but first, the um, there are some uh, other aspects that are away from wind that I will mention here. First off, you know, snow and ice uh, accumulation can be an issue at times. And so that's all part of inspection. But there are provisions already in AAC7 for, wind, for uh, what's called uh, aerodynamic shade or snow drifting. Uh, and areas to equipment. So PV actually fits right into that. So it, it, even though it doesn't specifically recognize that now in ASCE 7, A, number one, future versions will, it's in 2022 to specifically address PV panels, but, but the, but the snow, snow drifting due to the, the panels themselves are really already covered by the rooftop equipment. The another thing that you might miss, you know, a lot of people think, okay, I'm putting weight on the roof and need to make sure the roof can, can, can uh, withstand that weight. And that's important, obviously, but you're kind of doing a trade-off because generally speaking, solar panels are not walkable. So you're kind of taking away roof live load and replacing it with some dead load. So that you might feel good about that, but there's one aspect of this you need to remember. I'm also increasing what's called the seismic mass of the building. So I put, I put this equipment on this roof and an earth, if you're out west or someplace where there's uh, seismic activity and earthquake hits, that building's still gonna vibrate at, the, at, at, at that same frequency or close to it, but now it's carrying a lot more mass. More mass means more force. You know, uh, Newton's famous equation, F equals MA. So you pick up extra seismic force, lateral force when you add a PV system. So it's important to really be cognizant of those risks ASC 7 SIG 2016 has done a great job with wind load. So this is just your basic wind speed map for category risk category two building, which is your basic building. Not it's not uh, low low use, low occupancy, and it's not uh, assembly. It's just your typical building. Pretty standard. You pick off your your location, and then you get your map. So or you get your wind speed. So what do I do with that wind speed? Next slide, please, Mark. Well, this is where you get into your roof design and there's a series of equations that you, calculations that you do that produce some of the sample results that you see. And uh, you'll, you'll see in within chapter, uh, this, I'm not talking about PV systems yet, this is just the roof. Uh, we'll bring the PV systems in here in a second, but this is a hot zone map, if you will, they call the wind zone map, but I like to call it the hot zone. So this is where, particular areas of the roof experience a lot more load than others. And those examples that you see, I'd probably tell the story better than I can explain it, but you can see more than double uh, on the extreme edge corners uh, versus what's in the main part of the roof in the middle. So what you see on the left is a plan view of a hip type of roof. And then on the right, it's a gable type of roof. Uh, both of these are in the slope of seven degrees or greater. Uh, in, uh, or, or excuse me, seven degrees or less. Well, there's two, there's two tables. These photos are come from this less than seven degrees. There's another table for higher, steeper slopes. Um, but then you run through these calculations and those give you your numbers. Okay, all right, that makes sense. What about the effects of the PV system? So that's the next slide. And this, I think, was what Keith was driving at. And um, so this is, first off, ASE7 breaks these, breaks these systems into two groups very much along the lines of what we've been talking about. There's 
There are rack mounted, uh, uh, there's provisions for rack mounted PV systems on low slope roofs. That's what you're looking at right now. That is, uh, check my notes here. I think that is 29 point, uh, yeah, 29.4.3. And then there's also provisions for the flush mounted over steep slope roofs. Those are 2944. Um, I don't, this, uh, this, picture is from the, 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 the low slope provisions, but the, the flush mounted kind of ties into this as well when you read it, that there's no unique, uh, there's no unique drawings. But this is going to illustrate some points that I'm trying to make. Um, there are um, inherent things about these corner zones within this map. So uh, the PV module itself uh, can experience greater than average, just to, just to put some terms to it, greater than average wind load to number one, its location on the roof. And we saw that with the wind zone maps. And so this is kind of repeated here. Uh, that's what that top left uh, uh, diagram is showing you. But then they also can experience greater wind loads when they are the edge of the array. And that's what's on the far right uh, solar panel plan. Those shaded areas actually get a little boost in load. And then in between the two up at the top, there's a building elevation that shows you, you know, how the tilt and the distance, the offset, if you will, the distance from the roof affect the wind loads <clears throat> and how they're applied. And all this ties into the two charts you see on the left hand side, at bottom left hand side, they talk about normalized wind area. So What's interesting about solar panels, if you're familiar with ASC 7 wind design, they break everything down into the main force wind resisting system and components and cladding. So the framing systems for PV modules are considered main force wind force resisting systems. But if you plow through the provisions, you notice there's a lot of commonality with what's for the components and cladding. One of those things that are very common is that um, the uh, the wind, the the area, if you will, the 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 area of the that's receiving wind load for a particular element, as it gets smaller, the chances of that element seeing higher loads get greater. So, one of the comp, one of the calculations you, you do, you, you use this pressure coefficient. You get off the left hand axis, and you can see as its weight goes, as its area goes down those zone maps, they get very high. So it goes from like 2.4 down to, uh, what's that, about 0 0.5. So that's a four, you know, almost four time, more than four time increase. So those are big aspects. So what is that normalized wind area? Well, effectively, it, it's like the effective wind area, but really what it comes down to is whatever you're designing, let's just talk about a particular connection point. It's the amount of, of area supported by that element in terms of wind load. That could be a single module, could be a row of modules, could be a cluster of four, just depends on your framing system. The key thing that I'm trying to get a point across is that um, that area has a great impact on the amount of load and you have to very carefully select that area. And, and a lot of times you'll see guidance that, rep that doesn't really talk about this. Uh, and so really as an engineer, you got to look at each component and its respective supported area and wind load and make this determination on what this normalized wind area is, pull these coefficients off and then do your math. And what you'll find out is that um, these loads can get quite high, particularly for clusters of, uh, of uh, PV modules that are both at the edge of a, an array and also near the corner of the building. So you got to pay a lot of close attention to that. Thanks, Bob. Now that we've covered the, the roof conditions, um, let's move on with uh, the topic of equipment performance and testing, the, the product testing of the individual product. So Dustin, is that something you can comment on? Can't Dustin, you, there you go. Oh, you're muted. It's muted. Sorry about that. Uh, I'm going to try to be as brief as I can so we leave plenty of time for questions um, here at the end. But what's really important is making sure that the product that has been selected for the application has been adequately tested for the kind of loads that it's going to see or weather conditions it's going to see metallurgically compatible um, with the roof itself. 
here you're looking at some submergence tests. You know, the industry tends to like to look at wind-driven rain. Um, some manufacturers will take it to the next level and run the um, ASTM E2140 test, which is six inches of static water pressure over um, any, any component that might penetrate into the roof. Um, to the right, you're looking at pull tests where clamps are pulled specifically on the roof uh, that they're intended to be used on. You can jump to the next slide. Um, and then metallurgical compatibility. These are just a couple of things that um, one should be looking at when selecting a system uh, to, to marry the modules, this PV system to the roof. This is a 2000 hour salt fog test, illustrating a product that will essentially outlast the, the coating on the roof. Um, here you see the coating is completely annihilated, but um, the, the fastening system is still there and in good shape metallurgically. I saw a question come in from Mustafa uh, asking about 20, uh, 2703 and grounding and bonding, which is UL 2703 is a um, UL standard that tests everything from the rack up and grounding and bonding is one of those things within that test standard, which is module specific. Um, <clears throat> 2703 has fire rating performance. Um, it's got mounting, mounting mechanical load, um, grounding and bonding, all within that standard. And when I say grounding and bonding, that's maintaining that anything that's likely to be energized um, has a ground path, a path to ground uh, to prevent accident, somebody getting shocked accidentally by touching a piece of metal or something like that that they didn't realize was energized. Um, it's important when you're looking at your racking system to make sure that it has been tested um, to these standards as well. Um, absolutely. So I'm, I'm kind of speeding, so we leave time for, for more questions. So feel free to ask more about that here towards the end, but let's get to these next. The, the checklist is kind of brings us all together. Now, let me interject one thing on this, though. I mean, I see this test as not necessarily about how just rusting and longevity, but it's really about material compat compatibility. Are the right materials being put on a metal roof that will not create? Because if, if there was some incompatibility um, from a metallurgical perspective, th this, the results of this test would be that the materials would be just destroyed. Um, one, mater one of the materials, which depending on what part of the scale it's on, right, Dustin? Would, would be just dissolved pretty much. So this just shows that you, and an important part, I don't know if you can stress that with metal roofs, you wanna make sure you put the right material on them. And whether you have a steel roof or a copper roof, it really is important, the material, you know, what you touch, what touches the roof. Yeah, and I mean, so a question that kind of just came in was, you know, in terms of um, dissimilar metals. Uh, yeah, the that's, galvanic reaction. That's why we're running, you know, that's why it's important that these kind of tests are run. Um, you wouldn't want to use an aluminum clamp on a copper roof. MCA has published um, a document or a couple documents that make fastener recommendations for various types of metal roofs. Um, that is an industry-wide kind of document that is a good go-to. And if there is any questions about uh, metallurgic compatibility or dissimilar metals, the test you're looking at right now is a galvalume roof with an aluminum clamp and stainless steel fasteners. Um, the, that MCA document I'm referring to takes kind of a deep dive in looking at stainless and aluminum and why you can use stainless and aluminum. So if you have a situation that's saying, um, I have an aluminum roof, is it okay to use a stainless steel fastener? The answer is gonna be yes, due to the surface area. But if you were to flip that around and say, okay, I have a stainless steel roof, is it okay to use an aluminum fastener? The answer would be different because the surface area of the more noble metal is greater. And so um, I really would recommend having a look at that document because it, it, it illustrates um, a lot of these commonly asked questions within the industry and what is acceptable from an industry standpoint when utilizing various metals in combination. Good point. 
So, so I'll, I'll, I mean, Leanne, I'll just dive right into the checklist part of it. So we've already talked about the importance of site condition, knowing your site conditions, as Bob talked about. Advance, right yeah, if we could advance the slide. Yeah, I'll do that, yeah. So the, um, so the importance of the understanding that site, getting professional engineers to look at the site, make sure that the, you know, you calculate the right forces that are going to be on it that you need to resist. We know the importance of having the right product, have that engineered, have that tested. It's also important the company that you're buying it from. I mean, is that company, uh, been, what's its track record? I mean, what's the, what's people, what are the, you know, what, what testimonials, what were people's, um, sort of conclusion of, de of doing business with that company you're buying a mounting system from to put on a metal roof. That's as important. And, and beyond sort of how, you know, is a company a good company to deal with, customer support, also, you know, how do they manufacture, whether they contract it out or manufacture in-house, do they, um, what kind of, do they have an ISO 9000 listed um, manufacturing plant? Do they produce with quality standards that, that guarantee the, each product ship is going to be to that spec of that product with the right material. Do they certify that um, and by a, an independent auditor? So if you put all those together, and this is the thing that we did at the end of this third paper for MCA, was we put all those thoughts together on like, this is a good checklist to use, whether informally or formally, to like go through and say, this is the things that are important. And do I, have I done this? And who's, and really who's the responsible party? So it's a, really gets into about the project site conditions, um, the you know the building itself, uh, then the materials used are they are you using the right type of aluminum or using the right you know are the aluminum parts per the the, the correct specs? I'm not going to get into the details. Um, it also gets into uh, the sealants and the really important conditions that we really haven't reviewed, but gets into that aspect. Then it gets into the manufacturing, just what I was talking about. So it's a really comprehensive list to say, this is all that's important when I put, create this system and put it on my roof, my metal roof. And, um, and the, the point of this at the end of this third paper was just a, sort of the collection of all the thoughts we've talked about. So um, that's kind of how I'll, I'll, you know, we'll end this part of it now, I guess, uh, unless Leanne, you have. What, no, what you um, in, in wrapping <laughs> things up, I just want to reiterate uh, what Mark said. This, this particular checklist can be found on page three of the, the part three white paper, a mounting system and installation. And um, as Dustin had mentioned earlier um, about another white paper that the MCA has published. If you have not been on the MCA website recently or checked out their uh, all their educational resources, I would encourage you to do so. There are a lot of different resources on there whether they're white papers or webinars that you can view, videos, um, there's a whole list of, of different um, different types of education. Um, you know, solar and metal roofing is just one topic, and there's there's many other topics that are covered. So I would encourage you to check that out. And it looks like we've got uh, oh almost ten minutes or so left here, so we can go ahead and look at some of the questions that came in. Yeah, one that I see that came in in the chat that I'd like to like to talk about briefly. I think there's a couple that we can split between us, but there was uh, one Andy and I, we kind of talked about this earlier in, in uh, yesterday, but it says, I assume there are only specific metal roof products that are appropriate for the loads from the solar panels. Um, that's kind of a loaded question. Everything is going to have a failure point in the the key to engineering design is to design for the weakest link in the chain. And so you might have what is deemed a structural standing seam, um, like a three inch trapezoidal folded um, profile that is going to have better spanning characteristics than say a one inch batten cap architectural steep slope roof. Um, when you're doing pull tests, one roof might is probably going to perform much better than the other roof. The question is, is, does that make that one inch batten cap no longer a PV candidate? Um, and they, that question it can only be answered by looking at what the design loads of the PV system are and how that compares to the design loads of the roof. So if the design loads of the PV system are not as great as uh, the roof, then yeah, obviously it's still a candidate. Um, there definitely are some that are are better candidates than others. Um, the reason I bring up the one inch batten cap is because 
that roof really doesn't have a whole lot of flexural strength. Um, it's more of an architectural roof uh, where you look at some other roofs that they are designed to have great spanning characteristics and um, be more of a structural component. Type of roof is also going to impact, uh, we were talking earlier about load distribution on the roof and the attachment of the rails. Uh, the type of roof, the capacity of the roof is also going to uh, impact how often you're going to, going to have to distribute that load. So that's, that's something, again, that the designer will take into consideration. And uh, that's the designer of the roof as well as the designer of the PV system. Somebody asked a question about related about uh, exposed fasten versus non-exposed standing seam panels with respect to wind calculation, wind pressure calcs. Is there really a difference between the two? Um, you know, I, underneath the roofs, I'm, it, it all I'm, depends on how far the clips are as far as tributary area. But is, what I, do you, how do you I think, that? Yeah, no, I, I, I think, let me, I, I'm, I'm going to read between the lines. I think he may not, he may be actually referring to panels that are exposed uh, uh, to open air as opposed to covered by the, the module. Oh, okay. I think that's what that means. So I, I'm going to assume that and that that's the, the question. So what happens? Okay. Yeah. The, there's been some confirm, confirmation there. So as I mentioned, ASCE 7 breaks this down into the uh, uh, rack mounted, so that's not the terminology they use, but effectively rack mounted systems on low slope roof versus flush mounted systems on steeper slope roofs. Uh, and uh, what are, obviously you have to design the roof for the wind loads, uh, both with and without, maybe that's not obvious, both with and without the PV system, um, because it's not guaranteed it'll always be there. That's number one. And, but yeah, when you're talking about combining wind loads uh, for the, the, that are generated by the PV system and, and, and for the uh, uh, roof at the same time, um, all I can tell you is there's not a lot of guidance. There's no guidance on that in the code itself. Uh, so essentially that would mean that you design everything for the worst case at the same time. But if you want to dig into the commentary of ASCE 7, um, uh, 2016, they, they talk about this and some of the testing that's, un, that, that's kind of, uh, that's behind those provisions. And they do reference some instances, particularly for flush mounted uh, uh, systems where the wind load on the roof panel was in fact reduced somewhat by uh, the wind load acting on the panel itself. Again, the, the provisions of the code don't say you can take a reduction, but there is some background research in there. I would direct you to that research. Um, so that's that's the key key takeaway on that one. Yeah, and I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but also that Seahawk PV paper too allows for some of those wind reductions. And in many cases, Seahawk PV paper two will supersede uh, what's written in ASC seven. Um, because it takes a more specific look at solar slash roof combinations. Um, but in, in the gist, it's going to vary widely. But if you're utilizing a flush mount system and have an air gap in between your modules, um, there are some provisions that will allow for load reductions in those type of situations. I also want to real quickly ask, uh, uh, answer this question that came in. It says like PV should be treated like a dead load since it's presumed it'll be on the roof for three plus years. So here's the um, here's the key point. You, you, uh, we actually in the metal roofing industry in particular have have uh, talked a lot about collateral loads, okay, collateral dead loads, and and while not specifically mentioned in most codes, the the concept's pretty uh, pretty well accepted, and that is that a collateral dead load is a dead load that is not necessarily there for the life of the building. And um, so it's treated like a dead load in the load combinations, but there's one exception, and that is that you don't use it to resist uplift. So that collateral load, the, putting the, the weight of the PV system, and of course that would include the wiring and, and all the other things, rooftop equipment, that should really be called a collateral load for those reasons. A, you don't know it's gonna be there the whole entire life of the building, but also B, it may not be over the whole building and you get into an unbalanced load situation that should be investigated. And so you, wouldn't, you would discount that portion of the dead load. Uh, but that's a very good question. 
Something re also related um, to the exposed roof, the strength of the roof versus a solar that I think is very intriguing is there's a whole other type of products called wind clamps. And those are basically, this is for standing seam metal roofs. Those are clamps that are put over the seams and the purpose of them is to strengthen that roof from wind uplift. And by chance, uh, uh, the way solar is mounted on a metal roof, is, on a standing seam roof is ultimately by these clamps as well. So it is, so it can be seen as it's really not not calculated or actually talked about very much, but it can be seen as strengthening that roof. And and there are evidence of that. There have been some hurricanes that have hit, and there's houses that have had solar on them with standing seams with metal with clamps that have with that have withstood the hurricane. And nearby buildings did not withstand it. Um, and FM Global has actually documented written papers on that on that topic. So in some sense, with metal standing seam metal roofs, attaching the the using clamps to hold the solar system also strengthens the the standing seam roof itself from uplift. Yeah, I mean we've even we've also seen that in the laboratory on you know full scale tests yeah. that illustrate the introduction of a solar assembly with a seam clamp um, improving the performance of the overall roofing system. Was, did you see the question that just came in about the rack system on a flat roof? Yeah, I'm having a look now. So oh, I, I, uh, I'll, I'll make some comments on that. I mean, that's really the gist of this whole conversation, and, and Lillian really drove into the key question. The answer is, it depends. I wouldn't rule out anything out going into a solar project. I would look at all of these individual options, flush mounted, rack mounted. You can model them uh, uh, from a production standpoint, considering those factors and, and really tune in the performance of the PV system as a whole, including the roof and have it dialed in on what you're trying to accomplish. You've got project goals for any given project, you know, that you want to be sure and address those. So um, I would tell you that you don't, don't, don't discount anything, put everything, consider all your design options, but certainly flush mounted uh, uh, on a roof and in, in, in steep slope roofs and both low slope and steep low roofs can give you a very competitive answer there. So we'll definitely look at that. Yeah, and, and I mean, kind of to hit both of these high wind loads, um, I see there's also one in the, in the Q and A part about minimizing um, the effect of wind load. And there definitely are ways to do that. We, we touched on them before, flush mount systems, providing an air gap around all four sides of the module um, are really good ways to minimize the effect of wind loads. Um, and, and so that, yeah, it's less of a severe case, I mean. Generally, the lower the profile, the better from a wind perspective. I, I know tilted systems, some of them have wind, wind screens in front that create an aerodynamic effect that reduce the uplift. But generally, the lower the, the lower the, the lower your system is to the roof, the better it is from a wind perspective. All right. Well, we've reached a little past the hour now. I, I think we've covered most questions here. I think I'll mention one other thing I'm scrolling okay. through regarding the Calvanic action. Uh, I think Daniel made a comment that uh, the clamps sometimes dig into the ribs. So my, my if you did, then it's a very, very good point and uh, should be, should be pay, uh, looked at. If, if you look at the individual pieces of hardware for this, some of them, uh, the set screws that, that connect to the rail actually have rounded tips for that very reason to, to do everything to protect the coating uh, because that's obviously very important. The paint is not just the coating. Remember there's a metallic coating underneath the paint as well and uh, you wanna protect them both. But uh, yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, and I will just say, just look closely at the attachment method and the, the type of uh, a fa uh, fastener or set screw that's mm. there and make sure that it's, it's um, curved. Button. A question from Everett that came in from New Zealand. That one's kind of special to my heart because that's my uh, the territory space that I that I do a lot of work in. Um, we can definitely talk more about lifting up uh, flush mount systems for cleaning under the modules. 
New Zealand is notorious for growing things on roofs, um, even though they have a lot of things that grow on them. So the getting underneath the modules to actually clean the roof so that it doesn't create moss and mold and other funny things that happen to grow in New Zealand. Um, and there has been some things that we've done to work on that. I don't know a good way for you to get a hold of me other than just go to our website and click on support and ask for Dustin. Um, and you can reach me directly and I'd love to chat with you about it. Great. Well, I appreciate everybody's questions and participation today. I want to thank the panelists. And I believe all of us will probably be at MetalCon uh, this October in Indianapolis. So if you'd like to chat in person, uh, put it on your calendar for um, MetalCon in Indy. Thanks for your yes. time. Absolutely. Thank you, everybody. As a friendly reminder, you will be getting that very quick and brief survey that's going to come through at the end just so we know where to send those certificates to you. If you have any additional questions, you can always reach out to info at metalcon.com and we will share that information with the appropriate parties. If you have any other pertinent issues, again, you can reach out. If you know any of us directly, reach out to us or you can reach out to Metalcon and we'll get that information to um, whoever needs it. Thanks everyone for being here with us today and a very special thanks to all of our panelists and Andy Williams, Dustin Haddock, Leanne Slattery, Bob Zabzik, and of course, Mark Geis. Thanks everyone and have a great rest of your day. We will be excited to hear from you in the near future and we hope you join us on March 6th. Bye everybody. Thanks everybody. Thanks.